How many of you were here last week? If you were not here last week, share your hand. If you were not here or you have not watched the online teaching of last week, raise your hand high because I can't see you. Okay. Okay. I encourage you. We are in a three-week series. So if this is your first time for any reason, you're coming, uh, I, I would say at the right time, but also at a kind of like, you're going to have a hard time figuring out what we're all about. <laughs> Uh, not in a bad sense, but we're, we're talking about church structure, about who we are as a church, and the name of the series is a three-week series. We'll finish it up, by the way, we'll finish up this coming Sunday, and then the coming Sunday we'll have like an in-between sermon, and then the following week after that Sunday, <coughs> we're going to have an end times sermon series. So you want to plan to be here, because I'm going to tell you when the Lord's coming back. I'm trying to force you to be here. But we're going to look into that kind of topic, and I know you have questions, and TikTok is probably planting a lot of things in your mind. If you are on TikTok, I know most of you are not, mm -hmm. um, and you don't spend barely any time on it either. Mm -hmm. But um, the way I picture this series is the table, and I picture all of us sitting on a dining table, uh, at the dining table, you know, sharing a meal and talking to each other and having a conversation and me explaining what we're all about. And if you were here last week, I ask you to text TABLE to 432-242-8242. If you have not done that, and you're wanting to learn all about our church, how you can be part of the church, how you can commit to the vision of this church, you need to text TABLE to that number. And that's how we're going to follow up and we're going we're gonna to bring together our core group of uh, church uh, members and believers. And uh, I had a great response last week, so I expect nothing less but uh, a better response today and then the following week. And listen... I said this last week, if this church is to survive, is not because of or our programs, because of committed followers of the church and are committed to a local body of beliefs. Church is family. Church is family. I don't know where I would be without the church. And so last week we talked about a few things that, of course, I can't mention them. Otherwise, we would be here twice the time that we're going to be here, right? So if you missed last week, you need to go back and listen to it. And um, hopefully it will make more sense. Uh, this week will make more sense once you listen to last week. But this should be a standalone teaching, okay? So if you were here last week, and you didn't know, we are part of the Church of the Nazarene, okay? The Church of the Nazarene is a Christian denomination, an evangelical denomination. And the Church of the Nazarene, uh, last week we mentioned the verse where Jesus calls the disciples. And, and then one of the disciples goes and tells others about Jesus. found the Messiah. And, and he goes on to say, Jesus of And can anything good come from there? Jesus was a Nazarene. So when we say Church of the Nazarene, it's the church of the one who is from Nazareth, right? The church of Jesus Christ. And so if he was from Nazareth and God could do something with his life, God can, you, can do something with your life, with my life, and he's calling us to follow him. And so we're part of this denomination, and this denomination uh, is in 165 world areas. Here, I'll, I'll tilt it a little bit. See, you don't want to sit in the middle. That's your problem, not mine. Um, we have about 30,747 churches, 2.7 million, and we are all over the world. That means that you can go to Africa and Google a Church of the Nazarene, and most likely you will find one. You can go to South America, and you can find a Church of the Nazarene there. And they will worship different. They may preach a little bit different, but we have a core set of beliefs that we believe. We discussed briefly uh, some things about our beliefs last week. We may discuss a few more next uh, week. But what I want to talk about today is about patterns of the church government. See, because the tendency, especially if you are uh, a new Christian or 
sadly, sometimes the ones that have been Christian the longest are the ones that have more issues of confusion with churches and denominations. But you may have gotten this question as when you said, I go to the gathering. Oh, is that a non-denominational church? And you're like, uh, I don't really know. Well, I do, but I, I right? That's what I want to clarify. I, I want to explain who we are and how we function. And I want you to have the confidence when someone asks and when someone gives you a negative tone about a denomination, you can say, no, not all denominations are wrong. Not all denominations have gone woke. We are an evangelical denomination, and we have a solid theology, and we believe in Jesus Christ and the Bible and, and so on. But uh, I want to talk to you about the patterns of the church government, how the church is organized, in our case, within the church of the Nazarene. And so historically, there are three basic patterns of church government. The first one is the Episcopal pattern. In the Episcopal pattern form of church government, Bishops are elected or appointed for life, and they make the most basic decisions. Bishops appoint pastors, the voice of the lay people. Lay people is the church members, those that are not clergy, that are not pastors, that are just lay leaders, members of the church. And the voice of the lay people is limited in church affairs. That means that they don't say much about big decisions within the church in this pattern of church government. The second one is the congregational, in the congregational form of church government, local members, now watch this, or the local pastor have control. In other words, the church can do whatever they want without any accountability. They can change the pastor if the, church, the lay leaders have control. The pastor, if he has full control, he can choose not to leave, choose to stay, Force himself into staying, okay? Now, I'm, I'm, this may sound like a negative connotation. There are positives in it. Sometimes when they're spirit-filled, they can do great things. But they are prone to wonder to... Uh, anyway, I, I don't have time to give you all those details. But there are a few ties with other churches within the denomination. There is much independence and little worldwide coordination. In other words, the church is fully, almost uh, independent. Uh, then there is the form of government that is the Presbyterian. In the Presbyterian form of church government, there are no bishops, and local churches are part of a larger unit, which are represented by clergy and lay representatives. These, body, these bodies elect delegates to the general meeting, and the decisions of the general meeting are binding on the local church. So here's the question, a quiz question. We are part of the Church of the Nazarene. Which form of government do we have? I'm just kidding. Uh, any guesses? Well, the Church of the Nazarene draws upon all three models. Now, I'm not saying one model is better than the other, one is holier than the other. I'm just saying each Denomination chooses their own pattern of government based on what they uh, receive from Scripture, what they interpret from Scripture. The Church of the Nazarene draws upon all three models. And I'm just going to tell you how. The first way in which they draw from the Episcopal uh, model is that it draws a concept of superintendency at the district and general level. Here briefly, we're going to talk about the local church, the district church, and the general church. And that mindset or that structure is uh, drawn from this uh, Episcopal model, okay? Uh, the second one is the congregational. And so from the congregational model, the denomination employs the right of local churches to call their own pastors. For example, in our case, if I for any reason would end up dying tomorrow and you end up being without a pastor... You, the church, the congregation, has to figure out a way to find the pastor with the assistance of the district superintendent, of course. He will bring suggestions. He will bring potential candidates. But the church congregation and the church board, the leadership of this church, are the ones that choose their next uh, pastor. And so there is no... Uh, uh, the district is not going to come and say, okay, it's time for a new pastor and remove and bring a new one. Does that make sense? Amen. All right. <laughs> Presbyterian. From the Presbyterian model, Nazarenes have adopted a system of interlocking assemblies. 
that it, there is a district assembly and there is a general assembly. It will all make more sense here in a bit. Just bear with me, okay? Let's talk first about the general church. Now, what is the general church? Well, it's, it's the worldwide church, right? The church overall within the church of the Nazarene. I'm not talking about all the other churches, which is a beautiful thing. I can't understand how God is continuing to build his church, but he is. We just happen to be in a camp called the Church of the Nazarene. And in the general church, the worldwide Church of the Nazarene is led by a board of six general superintendents. In other words, these six general superintendents are like the pastors of the worldwide church. They are elected to a four-year term and each supervises a specific world area in our mission work. One of their primary responsibilities is to give leadership to the doctrine and the theology of the church. The word that I like to use is accountability in our theology. <clears throat> if tomorrow I would wake up and uh, feeling sick and started preaching things that are not within Scripture, well, first of all, I hope and I pray that you would notice and I hope that the, the, the church leadership would notice. And I hope that they would bring it up to our district leadership and they would notice. And then the general church would notice and then something would have to be done about it. The general board consists of representatives from around the world and they oversee the business of the church. Um, I know this sounds like a lot of information. It will all come back to us, I'll guarantee you. The General Church Assembly is the legislative body of the church composed of clergy and lay delegates from districts around the world. Major decisions and changes in the Constitution take place at the General Assembly, and these changes are binding on the whole church. A few years back, Norma and I had the opportunity to go to General Assembly in Indianapolis. There was like 20,000 people, 25,000 people from all over the world, different languages, different, different regions, different everything and we were all gathered to to worship the lord and to pray for the worldwide church and then there was a time set aside to make decisions see the church of the nazarene has a manual in that manual we see theology on salvation on heaven on hell on sin on the business of the church, on decision making within the church, on how to go about selling and buying property, which by the way, I'm going to take a moment to just make an announcement because I needed to make it official. But uh, last Thursday, your church board and I gathered and an opportunity came in terms of the building in Odessa to go ahead and lease it to another smaller church that is looking for a building. At this point, we don't have a big group in Odessa that is willing or able to sustain the building. The building is costing us about $2,000 a month between insurance, utilities, and maintenance. And we haven't been able to put a new AC unit, which costs about $50,000, $60,000 in the gym. And so we think it's a good opportunity to lease the building and potentially, potentially end it up end up selling it. This doesn't mean that what we have sowed in that building is wasted. God has given fruit and it doesn't mean that tomorrow God cannot provide a new way of continuing to do ministry there. This is just an opportunity that fell on our lap and we're seeing it as a God um, <clears throat> given to us. And so that decision, I cannot make it on my own. That decision, our board cannot make it on their own. In fact, we had to approve it as a church board, and then the district had to approve it. We just got the approval yesterday. So next week, we're going to take a vote as a church. And so church members, those that are committed to the church, given fully to the church, are going to decide, yes, we should lease it. And if the majority says, no, we should not lease it, then we have a problem, and we won't be able to lease it, right? So be praying about that, that God continue to lead us on that. But um, all to say that decisions are not made by individuals on their own. There's always accountability. Uh, much of the day-to-day -day business of the general church occurs at the Global Ministry Center in Kansas. This is where information and resources for districts and churches worldwide are gathered and uh, disseminated. Many different ministries operate from the Global Ministry Center and serve the global church. From that office, funds are given to, for example, Nazarene Compassionate Ministries. Uh, some of you have jumped in into uh, sponsoring children. 
We have a children's sponsorship opportunity in the church app. You can find that. Um, uh, world missions, uh, new church plants, all of that is coordinated there. Because every church, when we receive tithes, about 15% is set aside. And from that 15%, Part of it is sent to universities. In our case, it's Southern Nazarene University in Bethany, Oklahoma, to support higher education in the Christian uh, denomination. And then um, another part is sent, is sent to pensions and benefits to support uh, retired ministers and pastors. And then another portion is sent to worldwide uh, missions. If you have children, and if you go to the kids' gathering in the back, we have a big poster board with a map of the, of the world, and, and there are pins attached to different missionaries from our Church of the Nazarene that are in different areas of the world. Now, we as a church and as a district, we adopt a, a missionary family, and, and we're supposed to send encouragement and notes and, and just be in touch with them. I have to admit, I haven't been the best at doing that, but we're praying how we can do better in that area, okay? So this is the general church. The general church, I'm just going to go quickly through this, uh, has uh, legal and corporate matters of the global church of the Nazarene are handled by the general secretary operations officer. Uh, the global treasury services, like I said, that's where they keep the funds. They disburse the funds. Uh, and then we have the International Board of Education. These oversee our higher education institutions and our seminary institutions that we have around the world. Okay, so that was the general church. Then we have the district church. So the general church covers the whole world, and then the whole world is, is divided by regions. Our region, of course, is USA and Canada. And in USA and Canada, churches are grouped in districts. Okay. We are part of the South Texas District. So we're part of the South Texas District. Big Spring, now don't question how the lines were drawn. Big Spring is east of us, right? Right? Geography students? <laughs> Big Spring is part of the West Texas District. But we're in the South Texas District. Don't ask me why. In our district, we have about 100 churches. Is one of the largest districts. Uh, most districts have about 30. We have about 100 churches. Big. That's why our kids camp is big and our uh, youth camp is big and man camp is getting kind of bigger. Uh, but a district is led by a district superintendent. This district superintendent is kind of like the pastor to the pastors. And he supervises the establishing of new churches, the calling of pastors, now, notice it says supervises, okay? The calling of pastors, the coordinating of district activities, and gives spiritual guidance and encouragement. I cannot tell you how many times I've felt things, I've, 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 I've heard things, and, and I'm the type of person that I, I, I don't like too much the idea of saying, God told me, but nobody else has confirmed it. That makes sense. That, that's, if if you're ever in that position where where you feel like God is telling you something, but nobody else sees it the way you see it, it's probably not God. I'm just letting you know, because God will bring confirmation of what He stirs your heart about by provision, but also by voices that are above you and that have some wisdom and maybe even authority above you. So when I ended up, for example, at the gathering, before the gathering, I was part of another small church plant, and I was just serving. I've always wanted to just be behind the scenes, and God has a big sense of humor. Now he's laughing at me, but anyway, but, but I, I, I didn't want to know much. I, I was just serving. I was comfortable, but then I ended up with leading a, a, a small group of people, and, and, and then I, I started calling to the people that I thought we were under and they were like, no, we're just friends. And I found out that, that I had no accountability, no authority over me, no one to tell me yes or no or provide guidance or wisdom. And so somehow I ended up uh, with uh, uh, the Church of the Nazarene, and I, I found out that, that there's structure and authority. And I've always wanted to have that authority and guidance because where God, where, God, God, where, where God guides, He, 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 he brings confirmation through, through those that are above you. And so I found comfort in that. 
When I became the pastor here, I felt completely unqualified, and I still feel unqualified. But at that time, I was not an ordained elder. I had only preached about three times in English, and I had no experience in handling church business, church finances, church ministries. I had ideas, and I had the desire, and boy, was I crushed in my dreams when I thought things would be easier than they have been. But by the grace of God, we're still here. You're still here. And let me repeat myself one more time. If this church is to survive, it's not going to be because of me, because of the pastors of this church, or just the leaders of this church, or because of our facility or our programs. If this church is to survive, it's going to be because of committed church Members that love Jesus, love God, and love the Father's business, and love the church, and give to the church, and serve the church, and are being the church. So I pray for the church to survive. And so that's the district. The district superintendent is not on, its own, is not on his own. He has an advisory board, a group of clergy and lay leaders from within the district that help him make decisions. For example, when I called about the building and I asked Jeffrey Johnson, our district superintendent, can we lease this building? He didn't say, oh, sure, yeah, go ahead. No, he said, I have a meeting on Saturday. Send me the terms and I will get it in front of the board and we'll see if we get it approved. There's... Accountability, right? Amen. There's systems. And so then after the uh, district advisory board, um, that one is elected each year. Uh, and we have a district assembly. Us being so far of the district office in Houston, uh, it's kind of far away. So some years, some of our lay leaders have been able to attend. Uh, I pray that more leaders are able to attend uh, this coming district assembly. But... Uh, each year, we have representatives from all the 100 churches that gather together and give reports about the church and about their ministries. This last year, for example, I reported uh, things that you guys have been doing, like our food distribution and our after-school program and Mother's Day Out. And this coming year, I'll probably report that we opened up a homeschool co-op that is uh, successful and that is having an impact in Christian families in our community. But we meet, and, and the district uh, ministries and uh, the district superintendent and the pastors, they, 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 they meet at the district assembly. And it's also where the district superintendent and the district advisory board is elected. Okay? Uh, I'm just going to go through a quick list of six things that the district church include. Okay? Responsibilities. Number one, the examination of encouragement of people who seek service as full-time Christian ministers. If you would ever feel called to ministry, I hope you don't try to just do it on your own. <laughs> that, that's a formula that has caused damage to the church. There should be accountability. There are paths towards uh, ministry. And when I decided, yes, Lord, I'll serve you, and, and I ended up... Here, serving at this church, I, I didn't have any background, but, but they told me, oh, you need to go through a course of studies. And I had to study and read, and they made me take English like three times for obvious reasons, and that's another story. But you submit to the authority, and then you learn things, and then you learn theology, and then you learn. Uh, for example, here at our church, uh, Frank, our youth pastor, he's, he's pursuing this ministry um, and I pray in the years to come that more of you will say, yes, Lord, here I am, send me. I didn't know I would end up where I ended up. I just said, yes, Lord, and then I submitted to the authority and went through the studies and pursued ministry. Uh, they also oversee the planting of new churches and ministries, as well as the financial and spiritual support of small churches and ministries that cannot support themselves, the examination and approval of the, or disapproval of propositions submitted by local churches concerning building, the purchase of property, and indebtedness, okay? So they oversee that. So we're accountable to our district on that regard. The encouragement and growth of local churches in the area of Sunday school. Sunday school being kind of like a life groups, our education part of the church. 
the coordination of activities for young people in churches as well as children's and adult ministries, the informing, inspiring, and involvement of people in a vision for world missions. So we have the general church, the global church, six generals, a general advisory board that oversees the districts, and the districts are within regions, USA and Canada being our region. We have about 100 churches. There are many other districts around us, okay? Now, let me get to what I think is the most important part of it. You're like, finally, right? The local church. Without the local church, you don't have districts. Without the local church, you don't have a general church. Without the local church, there's no need for handling world missions and it would actually be impossible to empower missionaries and plant new churches. The local church is what makes, I believe, God's heart melt. See, Christ gave himself for the church. In fact, in Ephesians, we're told, husbands, love your wives, right? And wives, submit to your husbands, right? And we're called to love our wives and it says, just as Christ loved the church. Last time I checked, Jesus Christ is coming back for his bride. Yes, it's a personal commitment. Of course, faith is personal. See, it, it's kind of tricky because you can hide behind the church and pretend that you're part of the church. But you cannot be in passion uh, passionate love for Jesus and not be part of the church. Do you understand the difference? You can't pretend to be part of the church and not be part of the church, but there's no way you can be a Christ follower without being part of the church. Because Christ is coming back for his church. Pastor was sharing, Christ is the head of the church. And you can say, well, it's between me and God. Or, Attitudes like, that's why I don't go to church. Well, if you're not part of the church, how can you be connected to the head, as pastor says? The church is the body of Christ. Now, in the church, and just for the sake of information, the pastor, of course, is the spiritual leader of the local church. He or she is selected by the official members of the local congregation and is periodically presented to the church board in cooperation with the district superintendent for review and evaluation. The pastor is then affirmed by the board or presented to the official members of the congregation for re-election. In other words, I'm not here just because I want to be here. I'm not your pastor just because I want to be your pastor. Although I do want to be your pastor, don't get me wrong. But I had to go through submission and and prayer and fear and insecurities, but the church board decided maybe I was the one, and then the district came, and they prayed together, and yes, maybe he's the one. And then four years later, they came back, the district leadership came back, and, and, and they, they talked with our church board, and they, they addressed, and they questioned how is the relationship with the pastor, and what do you see that the pastor is doing with the church. If I would go cray-cray one of these days... Some of you are like, well, you kind of already are, right? <laughs> Just kidding. There are guardrails to protect the church. Because hopefully the church board is a spirit-filled board, Amen. right? That would notice something and they would come to me and say, Pastor, we think you're out of line on this or that. And, and then they would talk to the district leadership and he would come and evaluate and then if, if, if we can solve things there, then we would bring it to the church and the church would decide, you know what? Yeah, I, 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 I've been feeling this way and I think we need a new pastor or, you know, whatever. But there is accountability. But, but see, this is, this is what gets me, though, that it's the, the <laughs> sometimes what is expected of our leaders, uh, it's, a, it's a tool to justify our lack of commitment. Did you hear what I said? And what I want to, I, I kind of like want to turn the tables, not taking advantage of the table, but your commitment to the church is important. That's what I want to say. 
You praying every day for your church is important. Don't put it just on me, on Pastor Larry and the worship team. You are the church. There are brothers and sisters around you that need you to pray for them, encourage them, worship with them, grow in faith with them. But we keep thinking about the church as an institution, as an organization, as a club. The church is not that. It's, it's, it's much more than that. I don't know where I would be if it wasn't for the church. My mother took me to the church every week. She would pick me up on Wednesday. I would get home from school and go out to the street to run. And That's why I'm a little darker than most people because I was out too much. I'm just kidding. But he would come, she would come and pick me up and take me to church. And then I started serving in church. And my mother has been in the same church since I was about four years old. Not that long, by the way. And I've seen that church go through difficult times where there was division, where they went through some failed attempts to transition pastors and the church divided and, and horrible things happened in that church. And to see my mother's commitment to stay planted inspired me and encouraged me to stay planted for as long as I have to, no matter what. And so when things have gotten tough, you stay, you commit, you pray, you give, you trust, right? And I told you last week, what I expect out of this series is, is commitment to the local church is raise up leaders from within the church that are willing to stay for as long as they need to stay. And some of you have been here longer than I have been, and I admire your commitment to the local church. And so within the church, we have a church board, and the church board has several responsibilities. The, the responsibility is, is, is to be spiritual leaders and, and setting the tone to the church in terms of prayer, faith, love, and joy. And the board is not the staff. The board is just a sounding board that, that, where we filter through ideas and ministries and, and finances, and they oversee and they uh, provide insight and guidance and I'm so thankful that you guys that we have a strong board in our church and so you can come that way I'll start wrapping things up and so in all this uh, talk and all this informational session today we have the general church we have the district church and then we have the local church It's a beautiful thing, guys. When I became part of the staff here, I, I, I didn't know I would end up leading the church as the lead pastor. I had absolutely no experience. I never inquired about it. I never looked for it. In fact, let me tell you just a personal story. When I was a, about 12, 13 years old, I went to this youth prayer meeting. It was an all-night meeting. And there was a session, there was a time where I kneeled down in front of the altar and we were just praying. And I haven't had that experience, I think, again, at least in that specific way, but I, I just remembered God just taking a hold of my heart in a way that was undeniable. And I told God that day, I said, I'll, I'll serve you for the rest of my life, no matter where and no matter how. And since then, several things unfolded. I thought I was going to be a musician, a Christian musician. In fact, that's one of the reasons I moved to Midland. Um... Then I washed cars for about seven years in a mobile car wash because I wanted to have flexibility and freedom to serve the church wherever the church needed me. Um, I have only applied for a job in my life once, actually twice. The first time was at Best Buy because my pressure washer broke. But since I requested to have Sundays off, they didn't give me the job. 
The second time was at a restaurant, at a Mexican restaurant, because my pressure washer broke. And I worked there for five hours and went crazy with how similar all the Mexican plates look. So I quit, called my brother. He lent me like 500 bucks to buy another pressure washer and kept washing cars. And I remember being washing cars and thinking, God, is this why you brought me here to Midland? Because I'm willing to do whatever you tell me. I'm serving the church. I love the church. But, but I just want, if this is it, that's fine. Little did I know, right, that everything works for the good of those who love him. So here we are. I don't even know how many years later. And I was given the opportunity 12 years ago, or how long ago, 13, uh, yeah, about 12 years ago, to have a front row seat at how God can transform lives and how God supplies for the needs of His church. Guys, I didn't have, I, I didn't know that even though it's, it's all by faith, see, we, we, don't, we don't know how much money is going to come in to the church this week or this month but we know how much we need to pay for insurance insurance is about four thousand dollars a month we know the utility I, we, but i have a front row seat and i've seen how god has provided now the the, the church raises funds in different ways of course and uh, one of the ways that i thought it would be beneficial is let's open a, an after school program it, it it will bless the church we can hire some staff that can have double duties and over the years you know it's been challenging because it has to be state license and we have to go through all those things i'm extremely grateful for my wife norma that that, that put her name on that thing to be able to get it certified and and, and state licensed and three or four years ago, through that program, we had access to a grant that gave us enough money to re-carpet and repaint the interior building. I mean, that was a lot of money. And, you know, my thinking is like, man, God, you, you have a way of providing. And then the church also raises funds to, through special offerings, right? Sometimes you give, a spe like right now for the remodel of the exterior, we're almost done with it. Um different ways I think the most important piece of the church is the members <laughs> see the members of the church are the official church body and family there, there is no need for a pastor without someone to pastor <laughs> as members they take responsibility for being the church and for doing the ministry of the church my goal is that I can equip you to be the church and I am super thankful listen for different reasons I haven't been able to be uh, to be at the food distribution for the last I don't know six months maybe but it still happens <laughs> we have an amazing team of volunteers and parents that, that teach their children. And, and believe me, sometimes it's hard to make you serve. And we don't, we don't push you to serve because we are demanding you to serve, but because we believe in you. We believe that the church members are, are, are what stirs up the spirit of, of, of serving and, and God's love in, in, in our church community and outside of our church community. And so the church members are to take responsibility. You know, I kind of now get it why Paul said, do not get tired of doing good. Why would he have to say that? Because sometimes we get tired, right? And we need to be reminded, let, let's not grow weary. Let's not get tired of doing good because just at the right time, God provides for His church. Would you stand up with me? The third way in which the church sustains itself is through consistent giving. The majority of financial support comes from consistent giving, tithe. Now, if you know me, if you've been here long enough, you know I never force, I never uh, imply or try to put guilt. If you're not a giver, 
uh, I don't try to say things, you're missing out and you should and you should test. Like, although I know it's true, sometimes I feel guilty for not encouraging you enough to give, but giving works. And I give grace and I give space and I give time, but the only way this church survives is because of the consistent commitment in giving by many faithful believers in this body. See, just because you're not giving doesn't mean that someone else is not giving. <laughs> Consistent giving is what sustains this church. And we give because it is our duty, because it is a blessing, and because it's how we show our love for God. And it manifests in loving people. Honestly, I think we could end there, right? Church is family. And there are many churches. And much of the church growth in many churches is from other churches, sadly. <laughs> My prayer is that we can end that cycle. That your children, just like I did with my mother, will see your commitment to the local church and grow up thinking, church is important. I saw mom tired, but she woke us up and made us go to church. I saw my dad tired, but he made the effort to be at church. <laughs> Father God, it is my prayer, Lord, that you will continue to sustain your church by your grace, with your love, with your mercy. Father, I pray that as we uh, think about these things and commit ourselves, Lord, that you will guide us, strengthen us. Oh, Lord, you know how much I love the gathering. But it doesn't compare to how much you love the gathering. Many of us, Lord, are here because of the commitment of many that perhaps already passed away, <laughs> but laid a foundation for what we have today. And Lord, our prayer is that we can remain faithful for as long as it takes. Lord, that we may take on your mission and commission to win the lost and bring them to the knowledge of who you are and how you can save them and save us and redeem us. Lord, I pray that you will comfort us as we gather together that our faith will be strengthened as we worship together, as we grow together in faith. It is in your name, Lord, that I pray. And the church says, Amen. Amen. Let's worship.